All right, so Attack on Titan Season 4 Part 2 Episode 7 was a lot calmer than all the others. However, it was every bit as important to the overall story. We had the proper return of Annie and the establishment of her backstory, a glimpse into what the future of Paradise will be like after the rumbling, and the return of Captain Levi. All right, so to kick things off, we began with the Thross District, which is where John comes from, by the way, and it was a mess. To follow the events of the previous episode where they cleared out all the pure titans, we would have this recovery team who were looking for any survivors and trying to just salvage what they could. Whereas these scouts were on the front lines dealing with the onslaught of this invasion from Marley, the military police have been left to clean up, which is quite the juxtaposition from the beginning of the series where the military police pretty much had the best seat in the house. They commanded the most respect and were the safest. However, times have most definitely changed and so in these situations where we are dealing with foreign powers, we are going to war and we are actively in war. They are not nearly as appreciated in this society. And I for one was really happy to have this inclusion because while the rumbling was going on, I had to wonder, where are the civilians? What is going on? We are seeing a whole lot of destruction and not enough people in the fallout because it wasn't as if anyone could have prepared for what was to come. Now for a good while, we would follow the perspective of Hitch, who you may remember from previous points in the series, as she was paired up with Marlo a whole lot, who ultimately ended up dying four years ago in season three against Zeke. Now you have to understand that all that was happening here was a whole lot for these people to deal with and comprehend. I mean, they all were simultaneously pulled into a dream sequence of sorts where they were told by Aaron his plans and such. And that has to be a very jarring experience, even if you are a resident of the island and do not run the risk of being trampled by these colossal titans. However, people on the island were very much still feeling the ramifications of Aaron's decision making, regardless of whether or not they were being trampled by the rumbling. I mean, the old woman that Hitch was tending to would speak of how her home was destroyed by Eren, which really in the grand scheme of things is like the least impactful, least important thing of all. Like I get it, I'm sure her house really meant something to her, but there are people dying out there. And this would be expressed by several others as the wall crumbling was a very, very destructive thing. Eren destroyed all the walls. And so you can imagine the debris from these massive structures breaking apart most definitely destroyed a whole lot and killed plenty of people. I mean, people were dying when wall Maria was compromised by the colossal Titan and that wasn't even the entire wall. And so ultimately there was a cost to each and every one of Eren's decisions, which cost even his own people. But in times like these, where the people are so radical, so war oriented, they were willing to allow this. They were willing to accept this as a necessary sacrifice because of what Aaron was going to do to protect them against their foreign enemies. The people who would actively seek out their extinction. Pretty much saying the smoke goes both ways. You're trying to kill us all off, well, we're gonna kill all of you off. And I can most definitely understand both perspectives. I mean, if your son just died to falling debris, you're not exactly going to be thanking the man who broke it apart. And it is certainly natural for people to desire to be consoled or to have that sort of comfort after such a loss. But again, the people are so radical that you better just devote your heart and just forget about it. And as you can see, the people who perceive all this to be a necessary sacrifice are in the majority. So it's either you accept this and go with the flow or you straight up gotta go. There is no between with how this country is shaping up to be in the future. Now, when Hitch makes her way back to headquarters, she notices there is a watery trail leading from the basement into a random room. And pretty foolishly, she just goes on in. From which point she is grabbed from behind by Annie, who is a lot smaller than her, who also threatens to slit her throat if she screams. Doing so by way of the very ring she used to use to become the female Titan. Now, she would begin by commanding Hitch to take off her jacket first and foremost because she is wearing the outdated attire, so if she were to blend in, she would need to get a bit of an upgrade. But it has most definitely been a long time since these two have seen each other and Hitch is about that action, much to Annie's surprise, as she would just throw her over easily. In fact, Hitch couldn't even believe it because Annie was just so frail. She was so weak as compared to what she knew her to be such a lethal combatant, especially in regards to hand-to-hand -hand combat. But right now, she was just as spry as an elderly woman, which makes a whole lot of sense. Annie has been encased for a very long time now, and when she encased herself, when she crystallized herself, it wasn't as if she was in peak physical condition. No, she had just gotten ripped apart by Eren, expending her last bit of energy to crystallize herself. So take all of that and the fact that she hasn't even walked in so long, yeah, she's gonna be weak. 
Initially, Annie did not recognize this to in fact be Hitch, but when confronted by her, she would recognize her indeed, as these two were a part of the very same military police unit, and Hitch used to get on her case for sleeping in so late all the time, which she definitely took to the next level with this one. Not to mention, Hitch was always jealous of Annie, and so for her to throw her over like this had to be a meaningful moment for her. She would begin to call for some assistance, however, she would soon realize that Annie was bleeding, as she intended to threaten a transformation. However, with her being so weak, it was unclear whether or not she would actually be able to do so, but that's not the sort of gamble you want to take up. From which point we would later have Hitch assisting Annie in her escape, and we would actually learn something very fascinating. Annie, all this time, was able to hear the words of Hitch and Armin. Whenever these two would go visit her and pretty much just vent to a wall, she could hear it all. Now, it wasn't as if she could see or hear anything else. It was pretty much an unending dream for her where she would just hear their voices, whatever random stuff they happened to be talking about. Hitch would be talking about guys and Armin would be talking especially about the state of the world. Armin is a very intellectual guy, so he was definitely conveying a whole lot of useful information to Annie, which has essentially kept her in the loop despite being out for so many years, which is very convenient. And she also was present for Aaron's declaration, so she was aware of what was going on in that realm as well. Well, but even still, despite hearing that sort of stuff, I'm sure it is very difficult to even quantify the magnitude of these things without seeing it for yourself, which she did, and she was just baffled. However, rather than just gazing upon the colossal titans, Hitch would implore Annie to look at the devastation that came along with it, as we would see many people, many civilians, mourning their losses. And for a split second, I thought this man was Pixies, I swear. He has the same bald head, he has the same kind of mustache for the most part. I was honestly shocked, and that just goes to show how in denial I am that we lost the boy with the previous episode. But yeah, with this, Hitch would question Annie's morality, how she felt seeing all of this, seeing the aftermath of this destruction, which was not all too dissimilar from what she had done in the past, what she had done with the other warriors of Marley. Now, mind you, of course, it is not on the same scale. The rumbling is very much in a class all its own, but of course, there were many casualties to their pursuit of righteousness. But again, because Hitch had said so many things while Annie was crystallized, this was something that she was able to think about for a very, very long time, questioning her own morality, how she felt about the devastation that came with what she had done. And she would begin by responding responding that they were praised for such things. She would just give us the whole spiel that we know from Marley in regards to dealing with Eldians, dealing with foreign powers and the like. They were making up for the fact that they were Eldians to begin with, which is the sort of explanation that would have definitely worked out for Reiner. However, Annie was definitely not such a righteous believer. She didn't care about such things. Honestly, she just didn't care in general. Nothing like that mattered to her. She didn't care about saving the world, which would then bring us to her life story. As it turns out, Annie was abandoned immediately after being born, as she was the product of an affair between her mother and an Eldian. And interestingly enough, this sort of situation, being an Eldian child born out of wedlock, is something that Reiner is able to relate to. His mother was Eldian and his father was not. However, as opposed to Reiner, Annie was most definitely not physically weak, and she did not desire the affirmation of her biological parents. Annie would then be adopted by a man by the name of Leonhardt, who was a foreigner with Eldian blood. And for pretty much her entire life, he would train her to become a warrior for the sake of bettering his own life. He taught her in the way of martial arts native to his homeland and was very grueling, very demanding, very cruel in this training. No matter the circumstances, she was expected to excel. And in regards to making her a warrior, it worked wonders. Annie was entirely fueled by the resentment she felt towards him. And at that, Annie is just a different breed. Really and truly, I feel as though she and Gabi are the only ones who as children really and truly came across as warriors. Annie got the hands and Gabi got the stick. Really and truly, if Gabi had gotten the Beast Titan or the Cart Titan, she would have been a lethal force with how good she is at sniping. Anyways, over time, Annie would just become that good she would really get the hang of things and would even be able to overpower her master who she would just continuously viciously beat into until he could never walk the same way again but even though she super violated this man and he was in a whole lot of pain he would laugh he was very very happy because this meant that even without a weapon she was still every bit as lethal but even after becoming a warrior, Annie was messed up. She really saw no value in life whatsoever, and that included her own. She was just a drone. She did not care. 
that was until she was leaving for the island and here the man who had raised her would drop down to his knees and profusely apologize to her telling her that he raised her wrong that he did a good job that he taught her the wrong things here as he cried his eyes out he would beg her to make it back to return to him that she could disregard the honorary warrior stuff so long as she made it back home and it was in this moment that annie would realize that this man was in fact her father Certainly not her biological one, but he cared about her so profusely that from this moment onward, she would regard herself as his daughter. And so with her father awaiting her return, she had something to go back home to. Something that she is now able to actively recognize is the case for others as they have people that they care about as well. But regardless, she would do everything that she did again if it meant she would be able to go back to him. Attack on Titan is a series chock full of characters that so thoroughly violate human rights for the sake of their own human convictions. And it's not too dissimilar from Eren's outlook on things, that he would take someone else's freedom before they could take his. And so all the while, Annie has been moving with the intentions of returning to her father in mind, which certainly makes you rumbling quite the issue as at this rate her father would be slaughtered alongside all the others from which point we would then make our way to the perspective of annie's father as he and several other eldians in the camp which includes the families of gabi and falco of course heard aaron's declaration and were begging the marleyan troops to evacuate to no avail the troops would irrationally chalk it all up to conspiracy and although the eldians would at first begin to bend the knee in remembering annie's promise to return leonhardt would fight back and a shot would be heard. Now, this is easily one of the most expressive shots of Annie we have ever seen before, which should just go to show how much this really meant to her. We would then have a moment with Commander Shadis and some of the cadets he had previously trained and recently rescued from some titans. They would inform him of the Jaegerist occupation of the fort, imploring him to escape while he still could, considering he was a relic of the old regime. However, he would refuse, telling them to instead cooperate with the Jaegerists as they would be the ones in charge from now on. After all, to follow these events their former military has pretty much been exterminated with hardly any traces left things were bound to change forever one way or another and so it was best for them to simply fall in line and be obedient shadis saw no place in the country left for him very much seeming to be prepared to die here the cadets would speak of protecting him however he would make it clear that he had been protecting them all all along otherwise there would be no way they would have been able to take him down like they did without a fight so yeah shadis is an og he is a real one and in the stead of commander pixies he continues to keep it real he would express to them however that one day the time for them to rise would come that until then they should try not to lose themselves which is a very interesting and foreboding bit of information i mean if the rumbling does come to pass and the jaegerists do assume control this may perhaps be alluding to a new conflict after the fact with the scene between armin and mikasa it was pretty tense armin had a lot on his mind there was a lot on his plate and he intended to convince connie not to feed falco to his mother and this was for the sake of maintaining relations between them and gabi and by extension them and the other shifters as as Armin saw it, regardless of whether or not Eren was able to trample all life outside of the island, at this rate, the Titan conflict, the power of the shifters, was going to persist and be a problem for future generations. And so we hope that by resolving things now, by making peace now, despite the destruction to come to their home country, there would be a favorable resolution. Now, Mikasa would bring up Eren and Armin would lose it. He did not want to hear anything about Eren right now. That was just too much for him to deal with right now. He had so much on his plate and dealing with Eren and the rumbling was just of a different caliber. However, in losing his cool and yelling at her like this, he came to realize that he was the one who should have died. That in reality, Commander Erwin should have been the one to inherit the Colossal Titan's power. And I'm going to be completely honest with you, he is not wrong here. Truly, I believed that Armin was going to boss up after the fact and become a whole different character, become a more influential and pivotal leader, living up to his potential as such a big brain strategist. However, he really hasn't done so thus far. In fact, I remember with the beginning of season four, I was just so flabbergasted by the fact that Eren seemed to be the one to inherit Armin's intelligence. He seems to be making a bunch of plans. He seems to be figuring things out in such a calculated manner that we knew to be Armin's whole thing. And so when Eren was doing that, it kind of took away from the character of Armin. Armin kind of just became empty. He lost what he was. So despite him acknowledging this and the fact that you would expect Mikasa as his friend to say, no, 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 that's not true. You're the one who should be alive. She has no words for him because ultimately 
It's kind of true. But at that, Mikasa's scarf was missing, and obviously the only one who would ever care about Mikasa's scarf in a situation like this would be her fangirl, so we can expect it to be over there somehow. From there, Arma would meet up with Gabi as they intended to pursue Falco and Connie, and Gabi would be able to give her farewells to the family. From there, we would then see the Jaegerus in action. Flock was a madman. This guy is essentially to Eren what Yelena is to Zeke. He is a radical, he is a fanatic, and he does things in the name of Aaron Yeager. He shot one of the resisting volunteers in the hand to send a message, and then ultimately ended up shooting him in the head, double tapping him, triple tapping him to send the very same message. Now it's not as if we didn't already know it, but Flock is a madman. And what's crazier is that he began to actually convince John that he was right, that things were going to be better from now on, that thanks to Aaron's sacrifice, they would all be safe and he would be able to be himself. He commend John as one of their patrons heroes and then say that he can go back to being his reckless annoying and cheeky self which would have John be like what did you call me which I thought was really funny and just like out of place humor here but regardless we would then have John meet eyes with Oyonkopon which made his morality shudder now we have been at these crossroads with John before in the past where he had to decide between working for the crown and being a scout risking his life each and every day and when it comes down to it despite what he may say John is a real one and so what will ultimately be his choice in all of this is pretty much clear, let's be honest. Now, as he credits rolled, we would have Falco and Connie as they were making their way to Connie's mother. But Falco did not know this because having just become a Titan Shifter, he was missing a bit of his memories and he couldn't recognize Connie. He had a bit of recollection. He felt as though he knew the guy, but because he said, yeah, I don't know you, he was willing to believe. He's that naive. And furthermore, Falco is very grateful for Connie's kindness. And you could tell that these words were just burning Connie's soul. I mean, really and truly, if you resurrect your mother or give your mother the ability to be a human again by way of sacrificing this child, I don't know how she'll look at you. If she's a decent person, I don't know how she'll look at you. And I don't know how he'll look at himself in the mirror after all this. But that's a situation for another time. After that, we would have Peak and General Magath who are weighing their options, which they didn't really have any at this point. However, to interrupt them would be an unarmed Hanj. And considering she too is a relic of the past, she has no place to go back to at this point and is now desperate enough to team up with these Marleans. And with her would be Levi, who she said, refuses to die. So there is still hope for Levi. There is still hope that he will be able to recover and still be a sizable threat. And really and truly, even if Levi is injured, I mean, he's Levi, even if you nerf him, he's still way better than most other people. Currently, everyone that they would actually consider to be an ally that they could trust believed them to be dead, and so their involvement, their return to the fray, may very well be a rejuvenating aspect to this whole situation. But that's it for the breakdown, guys. If you enjoyed the video and want to see more like it, be sure to subscribe to Plot Armor with notifications on. We also have a brand new Western comic channel by the name of Plot Armor Comics, where we cover Marvel, DC, and things like that, so if you're interested in that sort of content, be sure to check us out over there. But when it comes to bringing you some of the best Attack on Titan content on the platform, Plot Armor has you covered. As always, I'm Slice of Otaku. Thank you all so much for watching and have an awesome day. I love you.